Hello all, sorry to drag you out of the beautiful evening tonight and bring you into this meeting, but there's a lot to share here and you guys are gonna be in for a good uh, educational um, learning of Lake Boone later on. Uh, so welcome to the LBA annual meeting. We're kicking off our 101st year this year. Big, big uh, stuff coming up. A little further away. The, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, last year, we ended up our 100th year with purchase of Hollick Point, and that was a big, a lot of people helped out with the volunteering and, and fundraising, and we had help with the Stowe, or in conjunction with the Stowe Conservation Commission and the Stowe um, Conservation Trust. Um, and with all that, last June, or the last meeting they had last year, they approved it. So uh, big stuff coming up with that later on. Um, we have our 101st year kicking off, and we have the Healthy Lake Boone Initiative Program that has been going on uh, annually here for a couple of years, and we've really done a lot of uh, studies in the lake. You're gonna learn a lot more about that uh, with some local volunteers, a citizen scientist uh, that was headed up by Dan Barstow and Dave Gray, and they really, you know, um, brought people together, uh, Brown and Caldwell, and you'll hear more uh, about that coming up. Um, a lot of people are taking advantage of, of the uh, vacation slash summer houses, so they're, they're putting a lot of pressure on Lake Boone. So with this new program coming up, we're going to learn how to hopefully mitigate some of the phosphorus loads going into the lake and, and make it um, really work for us. So um, what else we got? So to start off, um, actually, why don't we find out how many people are new to this lake? I know a couple people back there because they just moved in, my neighbors, Bennett and Mary Ellen over there. And um, so they've been here less than a year. Anyone has been here from a year to five years? 10 years? We got red, it's been 10, 20? A lot of people in 20, and then what about 40? We'll skip right up to that, over 40. 40 plus? Yeah, there you go. So, so a lot of, uh, for the new people on the lake, there's, there's um, two associations, or two lake, there's a Lake Boone Association, which we are the Lake Boone Association, and we are a nonprofit incorporation um, who is in, charged with the um, education of recreational and environmental and um, services, um, our social events for our water carnival and, um, is our big one. And then we have the Lake Boone Commission, which is the governing body of Lake Boone. And they've been established since 1941, and they're responsible for the regulations and the safety, safety of the town waters. Uh, of Lake Boone. And um, we have Chris Cramblin here tonight. She'll address the, the meeting um, with the, their report and Dan Barstow as well. He's, he's uh, one of the members of the Lake Boone Commission. And then there's one other, Connie uh, Wharf, who isn't here this evening, uh, who is the Hudson side of the Lake Boone Commission. So for that, uh, we'll bring it right over to the Treasurer Report with Dave. Okay. Yeah, good evening. Uh, the, yeah, the Treasurer's Report, I'd like to show a couple of years previous so you can see a comparison. And you can see the income from the Healthy Lake Boone Initiative was very substantial in order to enable the purchase uh, or contribute to the purchase of the Halleck Point uh, Land. So that was a nice income there. And then some of it is going toward the um, 
uh, matching some of the grant funding uh, needed for the study that we're doing for the lake. Uh, otherwise, uh, actually some of the Lake Boone fundraising was uh, shown under fundraising last year so that this, uh, whoa here, yeah this 26,000 actually was including uh, Healthy Lake Boone fundraising as well. But it can give you an idea here and um, of course we made this uh, payout to uh, help purchase the land. And we have some additional uh, uh, payouts that we have to do for the grant match. And uh, we have ongoing expenses with the uh, Healthy Lake Boone for monitoring, having laboratory tests done uh, for some equipment. And actually some of the equipment is here, so you'll be able to see that if you want to take a look. And one of our fundraisers is the wonderful Lake Boone calendar, so we're glad to have so many people participating, sending in pictures. So the balances that we have now uh, are, are very high. It looks great, but uh, things, this was as of December 31st last year. So it ain't this big anymore. <laughs> so that, uh, the payouts went down. And um, as I said, we'll have some additional payouts. But uh, uh, we're financially looking good, and we really appreciate the uh, contributions and the um, uh, renewals of membership that are going to help us finance this and to keep it going forward. So thank you. Uh, just some statistics. You can see uh, what kind of mailing list we have. And uh, with 50% of people on email, that's really great. We have a good opportunity for communication very quickly. So uh, if you can encourage your neighbors to sign up too, that would be uh, terrific because there are things sometimes that are urgent like an algae bloom or um, some other warning coming from the town. So uh, the more people we can get on that list, the better off we are. Uh, the Ronnie Fund is uh, in memory of Ronnie Pastuck. Uh, it was a tragedy when he was very young and so we've uh, really wanted to stress child safety around the lake. And uh, we do reimburse uh, swimming lesson uh, tuition or fees. And if anybody has additional ideas for water safety for children, uh, we do have some funding for that. So uh, I know one year they did a, a program on ice safety. Uh, we ran one at the beach. Um, I think Laura was in charge of that uh, with uh, children's uh, safety on the water in boats and uh, uh, various things. So uh, that's something that we would like to re-energize if somebody has ideas and uh, a way to execute those. Uh, the food project, uh, Barbara Clancy is not here. Uh, but uh, this is a program that she has been doing with uh, a, quite a number of volunteers around the lake to contribute to the Stowe and the Hudson food, food pantries. And it's been a uh, great income or a great source of food and uh, something that allows us to help out those who are in need, of which there are more these days, it seems. So one of the uh, great things we do for the lake is our septic, uh, discount septic pumping program, which a lot of people here are, are part of that. And uh, it seems like we have a pretty consistent 40 to 50 people in the spring and in the fall. So we get a lot of septics pumped in the lake, uh, out of the lake, to, to help the uh, flow in it. And so I mentioned we have the, uh, the Lake Boone Commission here, and this is Chris Cramblin who's been the chair for the Lake Boone Commission and is actually just retiring <laughs> her job. So we're going to put her on the spotlight here for one last time. Yeah, hi, I'm Chris Crablin, and we also have Dan Barstow here as our, our second commissioner from Stowe. Um, just a quick overview of last year, 2021. So we, we do hold public meetings. We attend meetings. Um, it's a little, that's actually down from the year before. We had a lot of things to cover in uh, 2020, 2021 mostly, uh, where it, this is sort of a normal thing. I think we'll, we tend to be around 
um, about 10 meetings a, uh, a year. Um, and all of them this past year have been via Zoom, so we had no in-person. Uh, I suspect that is going to change in July, um, when unless the, the ruling is, is uh, extended. Um, but it's been a really great experience, actually, being on Zoom and getting the, a, a lot of participation from folks very conveniently. Um, so, and also we record those Zoom meetings, so they show up on show, Stowe TV, and also uh, they're on YouTube, so they're stored there. Uh, if folks miss a meeting, want to go back and look at something. Um, so we, we do the herbicide treatments uh, on, on the lake. That's the, one of the responsibilities is, is, uh, is kind of governing that. Um, our, the vendor we've used in the past, Solitude, um, we had some issues with for communications and some other things. Uh, so we did put it out to bid this year. It was, it was time for a new contract. Um, we we did we did get uh, we did get a, another uh, vendor involved, but it did it did end up being a solitude. Um, it was a solid bid. Um, we made a decision to contract it out for a year. In the past, we've done three years, um, so we had you know sort of the plan and the money and everything. Uh, pre-established what we're doing this time is a one year and built into the contract really is a review and uh, an assessment of what the plan will be for the following year kind of in conjunctions with the, a lot of the the findings from the Healthy Lake Boone initiative so a chance for us to make adjustments um, and work through that um, just wanted to uh, again shout out the, the tremendous work that was done on the Healthy Lake Boone Initiative. Um, that, that grant um, was officially sponsored through the Lake Boone Commission, but really the work was primarily through the Lake Boone Association. Uh, Dan is our member from the commission and tons of volunteers, uh, so great work. Um, we also, as a commission, supported the, the Halleck Point um, preservation work in Stowe and also uh, had some you know, representation trying to gain some control around what was going on with the Cattell property uh, in Hudson. So um, not that we have authority, but just uh, kind of being a, a presence it has been good. Um, so 2022, um, so we did do the lake refill. So every year we do a drawdown in the fall. Um, the, the lake did refill this spring. Um, we do have a new uh, safety officer from the uh, Stowe Police, so uh, Lee Heron, that many people know, been on the lake for a very, very long time, was a commissioner for many years. Um, he had retired uh, last year, so they were kind of piecing together how to, to cover the patrolling uh, on the police boat in the, uh, on the lake. Uh, and so we do have a new person, Jeff Beckwith, um, who is starting. He was out there uh, I had on, over Memorial Day weekend, and uh, I, think, I think we're going to uh, be very happy with uh, his work. So, um, Herbicide treatments, so our spring treatments, um, we did have the initial treatment, and that was back in April, late April, um, and in May we had a booster. Uh, we were seeing, uh, based on their coming back out and also some reporting through some of the, uh, the members of, of the community, we, were, we felt like there was a need for some area, spot areas, so there was a booster um, and some additional work done uh, just a week or so ago. Um, and then just uh, kind of the last big thing is, again, in the fall, there'll be a drawdown. Um, and uh, that usually starts right around mid-October. Uh, so, and then, uh, as I think was mentioned, um, so I am leaving the commission the end of this month um, and uh, have had a wonderful time. I great, great partners, uh, both on the commission and through the LBA, the police, so it's been great. Um, if anyone is interested, you can, it is an open position. Uh, you can apply through the, the town of Stowe. Um, so I think that's it, unless there's uh, questions.
I think we should, uh, we just want to point out that the Massachusetts voting laws apply to Lake Boone, and there are some things that should be read from this guidebook. You can download this, it's readily available, and uh, some of them are very pertinent to uh, what goes on on the lake, and uh, so that little guide there is, is very worthwhile. Yeah, th there are links on the, uh, both the LBA website and the LBC website. Both have links to that. And then Lake Boone has its own rules, too. And uh, those also are uh, available at those websites. So voters, be aware of these. And then uh, we also want to give a plug, I guess, uh, our historian is not here, but Dick Gelpke put a lot of work into this, and it's available back here, uh, your personalized issue, and uh, it has a, a lot of written history, a lot of clippings from old newspapers going way back. So he's got a, um, quite a comprehensive coverage, and the second half, or the appendix, is available online. You can download this for nothing, a PDF document, and uh, it's pretty interesting. There are some... Uh, really key things about the lake. So uh, if you haven't got a copy yet, uh, this is a great opportunity to do so. Do you so we decided to do something uh, special this year and probably going to continue to uh, recognize the people who've really done a lot of work for Lake Boone. Um, so like Dave mentioned, Richard Gelbke, he's uh, one of the definitely history makers on Lake Boone. He's been here probably 50 years plus. I don't know if anyone knows, but I bet it's, I bet it's over 50 years for him. Uh, and then another one we have is Lou Helpern, who's another one. He's an archivist. He's, he's been taking care of the um, um, Hudson Historic um, commission over there and taking care of our portion, which you guys will learn more on later, uh, of our uh, historic facts and stuff, uh, organizing it over there. Also, we have Barbara Clancy, who's uh, done the webmaster for us, the Gazette, uh, the food pantry, and he's, uh, she's been a coordinator for many years. And, and another one we have is Scott Alving, who's really helped us out uh, now that we're kicking off the, all our fundraising and stuff uh, with the taxes and stuff. And he's just donating his time, so it really helps us on that. Um, Lee, who's put a lot of hours uh, in the patrolling and stuff, um, and Chris Cramblin for her organization skills on the LBC. Again, I'd like to hear another round of applause for her because she's done a great job over there. Yep. Uh, we got Dave Gray, communications and water measurements, and, and since he's retired, he's probably put more hours into this than... <laughs> than he does on his own job. So really, a round of applause for him. Dave Gray, and then Dan Barstow, uh, who's been the manager of the Healthy Lake Bone Initiative and uh, helped with the grant proposals with the Stowe uh, Conservation Commission, uh, sitting right here in the front, also part of the LBC. So thank you, guys. Again, retired and put to work. That's what we like to see. And uh, again, all the other volunteers, people at the table, and, and Dan uh, Nicholson up here, really in red, really help out a lot. Thank you. OK, most of you already know what's ahead this summer. Event-wise, we have, oh, yeah, some, some impromptu concerts and some are scheduled. Uh, we have Hard Knocks coming this year on the 14th. We have the, the new and improved date for the Water Carnival, Labor Day weekend, which is the historic uh, weekend that uh, many carnivals have taken place on. So we're back to Labor Day. So tell you, you know, I know there are a lot of people who aren't here for various reasons, and uh, any um, help communicating the dates would be uh, very much appreciated. Um, because a lot of people say, oh, I thought it was the week be weekend before Labor Day. 
Um, Lighting the Lake, followed by, followed by Music, <coughs> Lighting the Lake and Music Boat at the same time. Um, let's see, what are we doing first this year? Uh, which basin, thank you, first, first basin first. Um, meaning that we do a f sort of a figure eight or a you know double loop, so it's alternating. If you didn't know, alternating between the first and the second being the first one. Um, then Saturday, the fun continues with lots of things for kids and adults, um, including canoe races, field events, and some sort of entertainment to be determined for the kids mostly. Uh, lunch is served and. Uh, then after lunch, beach events. Um, history boat happens on that Sunday morning of that same Labor Day weekend. And then at 2.15, giving people enough time to get out to the start of the parade, uh, we begin, you know, 15 minutes into quiet hours and launch the parade. And again, tell people who might appreciate uh, knowing the dates and times for these things, I, I would love that. So, um, and then a relatively new event is the regatta. So anybody with a sailboat or has access to a sailboat, come on out for, again, quiet hour, uh, four hours um, on that Monday for sailing, weather permitting. And then this year's history walk, formerly known as the walkathon, is on October 15th, a walk all the way around the lake. And I want to make sure I don't forget to thank uh, Jonathan Daisy, who is putting this out there for the community, and it will also reinforce what I was saying earlier, getting the word out about these events, because I, I always appreciate when I can catch up on a meeting of any kind because of this guy's work. So can we give a little round of applause to Jonathan? <laughs> Here's some photos, and I, I think I had one more thing. Oh, are we going to do the minutes next? Yeah, I can, yeah, after we look at some slides. Did you want to talk about the slides? Uh, they speak well, for they speak, this was pretty cool. The, uh, the um, uh, what's the name of that thing? Carousel, the carousel organ, not, not to be confused with a calliope. calliope. It's almost a calliope, because there's no steam. And here are some highlights. Uh, yeah, the, the, the turnout was good considering COVID. I think people really were up for it. Man, everybody wanted to get outside and do something. But it was a good summer. And pretty good turnout for the boat parade. We always want people to enter no matter what their artistic or visionary ability. <laughs> <laughs> My wife had a vision to do a flamingo, and the next day we had a, pretty much had a flamingo. There's the regatta on the right. Pretty, really good turnout for the history walk, and uh, if you've never done it, you know, you get to read um, signs along the way, so learn as you go. Uh, the merch, I think... You already know that there's a lot of good stuff over on that table, and uh, we are looking for someone to take over the merch because my daughter Sonia over there is going away to college. She, so please think about that, and we're going to have a little time for coming up with actual names. And you'll see what I mean in a, in a few minutes when we get to nominations and stuff. Oh yeah, that's right, the archives. Someone. Can talk about. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do the minutes. You want to do that? I'll do the minutes. Do you do the minutes? Yeah. So um, we are breezing through this portion of our meeting tonight, so we can spend a lot of time on the Healthy Lake Boone Initiative. So uh, we ended up forgetting our minute uh, to be read and approved from uh, last year. So um, our um, secretary tonight is home with a uh, migraine probably from all this pollen that's been blowing around lately. So uh, 
he sent us the copies, so we're going to do our best at reading and coming up with a motion to approve them. So the meetings of the 2021 LBA annual meeting, as read, are we had the meeting held via Zoom at 645. Um, we opened at 645, scheduled at 7. So a brief introduction starting at 712, brief orientation to Zoom, muting of microphones, 35 total participants on the Zoom call. So the 20, 21 minutes read, uh, and we vote, voted to approve the minutes. Uh, the motion was made, second, and approved with no discussion. Attendees asked to unmute the voice concerns, if any. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, financial report was read with details on donations, matching grants, et cetera, for the Healthy Lake Boone Initiative. Uh, lake programs discussed was the Ronnie Fund, current swimming lessons, and potential other future options. We didn't get the swimming lessons this year, did we? Yeah. Um, lake food project, details on project totals for Stowe and Hudson Food Bank, donations, Info on how to join Lake Resident Discount Septic Pumping Program through the Caselli Trucking. LBA members asked to consider volunteering to manage the email list for this program. Update uh, presented by the Lake Boone Commission had dam condition update, which for the newcomers is the thing we drive across. I'm not swearing or anything here. Update uh, from the dam, drawdown, uh, discussion on bylaws, limits for boaters, watercraft, and the Stowe Police Patrols. Uh, we did the Lake Boone history, book announcement, details on availability, vote held to continue to house, house the LBA items at the Hudson Historical Society, which we'll do again tonight. Motion made. Second approved with no uh, dissent, following same procedure as above. Presentation on Healthy Lake Boone Initiative, Lake Study, Recognition of Volunteers and Discussions, Discussion of Upcoming L LBA Events, Potential COVID Restrictions Depending on Course of the Pandemic Waves, Reminder that Water Carnival is Labor Day weekend and History Walk to be October 16th. The LBA merch department molded, uh, modeled uh, new shirts, hats, bags, et cetera, and discussed how to acquire these items. The officers, directors discussed current slate of offers, officers willing to serve another term, uh, if so desired by the LBA members. A motion from the floor to reelect current officers was made, second and approved with no dissent. Some addition, additional discussions on various topics, ways to get involved as officers, et cetera. And the adjournment, um, not really a time. And the motion to adjourn was made, yes, and approved with no dissent. Missing Zoom, uh, meeting Zoom ended at 8.42. Did I miss something? No, you got Some good? Yeah, I seen that. So, um, I would like to make a motion to accept the 2021 LBA annual meeting min minutes as summarized. Is there a second? We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? So it's passed unanimously. Thank you. So the, uh, the Lake Boone archives, which were very helpful when it came time to celebrate our centennial anniversary and uh, to be able to provide a lot of history into the, um, into the Lake Boone Gazette last year and also Richard Gelbke's book. Uh, so he spent a lot of time on those. So these have been kept by Lou Halperin, uh, Lou Halperin which I said he is a real hero for staying with us for so many years and making use of it and supporting that. Incidentally, these history books, he gets these at the author's price and donates them completely to the LBA. So when you buy a book, it's 
uh, going to the LBA. So it's uh, very generous of him to, to do that. So anyway, uh, we have agreed that we want to have a, um, an authorization by the LBA each year to maintain these archives at the Hudson Historical Society site. And it got relocated to a different room and got set up. Uh, Lou had this all set up, and um, uh, so it's, it's looking very good. So do we have a motion to keep this? Uh, okay. And Jake, can you say where this is? Yeah, this is in the mill building in Hudson on is it Broad. Broad Street. Broad. Yeah, Broad Street. Uh, it's the old mill building. It's up on the fourth floor in there. So you can take a freight elevator if you really uh, want to. Um, so, uh, is there a motion to continue keeping these uh, archives at the Hudson Historical Society Museum while they're maintained separately but in the same room for a period of another year? So move. So move. Second? Second? Any discussion? Okay, those in favor? Opposed? Okay, I think we have another unanimous uh, vote here. Good. So now we come to the part that elects all of us. So after talking to everyone here, as well as, well, Kevin actually is uh, our secretary, and he's willing to stay on, but his time is committed to other things. So we're actually going to, we're looking for a new secretary if anyone wants to step up and volunteer. Is there any volunteers out there yet? All right, so we're going to let Kevin know that since he's not here, we're going to raise his hand for him. <laughs> so. <laughs> which he, he technically agreed to. So we have myself as president um, and Dave Gray as treasurer, Dan Nicholson as vice president, and Kevin Hunt. So um, I'd like to make a motion to reelect the current LBA officers at, uh, for another one-year term. We're looking for a second. Any, uh, any discussion? All in favor? Any volunteers? No? <laughs> all right. Any disapproval? Guess not, so we're all elected again. So do we adjourn this part of the meeting? Yeah, I think uh, a motion to adjourn. Well, oh, oh, well, oh, you want to go through the uh, window? Yeah, exactly. Okay, just a clarification about the bingo. Could you please write your name at the top when you're finished your bingo sheet? If you, are we gonna have a little milling around time? No. So this is your last chance to fill in your bingo sheet. If you have five in a row in any direction, diagonally included, you will get a bingo point. And I'll add up the score. I'll, I could, if I have a tie, I'll see who has the most squares circled with, with uh, honor, honor system here. Write your name if you qualify for anything in the box, and we'll collect them over there. Julie, my lovely wife, will collect the bingo sheets as soon as you're done with your name at the top. Thanks for playing. Just wanted to announce we're going to host the Lake Boone uh, Carnival judging party again this year, and everybody is invited. If I don't have your email address, a lot of you I don't. If you want to put your email address, if you think you're coming, just so I get a sense of how many 
people to order food for, but we live at 200 Barton Road, and we've been doing the judging of the carnival parade for a few years now, and boat parade, yes, sorry. And um, we'll be doing it again this year, so hope to see you there. So we're pretty much going to wrap up our meeting at this point, um, the business portion of it. And we're going to go into the Healthy Lake Boone initiative discussion, which uh, Dan Barstow will, will take over and, and uh, lead the presentation and introduce all the, the key players that have really done a lot of work on this. So um, with that, I would like to make a motion to adjourn the 2022 LBA annual meeting. Do I have a second? Is there any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Passes unanimously. So as of that, we'll hand it off to Dan. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for uh, your participation in this part of the meeting. Now this part's going to deal with this, uh, give you a report, a summary of uh, what we've done over these past two years with the Healthy Lake Boone Initiative. Uh, I say a summary, in fact we're going to go through some detail so you understand the science that we learned and the recommendations that we're making to keep our lake beautiful, healthy, happy, and sustainable over the long run. But before doing, saying anything, I really want to thank so many people. I think one of the major causes of success has been the participation of huge numbers of people. So uh, in, in no order, but just mentioning some, uh, Dave Gray, if any of you have seen him go out on his bicycle every morning to go down to the dam to do the measurements, record those and get involved in many other ways, he's going to present some things about the measurements we did. Um, I don't see Kirk, is Kirk was, oh, there you are, okay. Um, Kirk Westfall is a scientist. Uh, we are so fortunate to have him live on the lake as well as being uh, a lead scientist for the company Brown and Caldwell that set up the modeling structure. So Kirk, uh, Dave Sawirski of course has made sure that the LBC, LBA connection was strong. Chris has been doing the same thing in her role with uh, the LBC. I want to introduce Rebecca Longval. Rebecca actually is uh, from Bolton, where she is the conservation director for Bolton, akin to Kathy Sfera's job. But she um, somehow found the extra time. Uh, she was a paid uh, consultant. Thank you for doing that. Uh, to manage uh, the volunteers who were citizen scientists, uh, but also led the work on accumulating some 40 or so recommendations to keep the lake healthy. That was a huge task, and we really want to give a big thank you to Rebecca for that. Now, the next question is, who here was involved as a citizen scientist collecting some uh, data? Okay, so Sonia, for example, Sonia as a student uh, at Shoba, uh, corralled uh, several other students from what's called the green team and it's so encouraging to see that going on in our schools uh, and led uh, you'll see some pictures of her doing some of the data collection uh, and then I want to know who here has some responsibility for taking care of the health of the lake as we move forward into the future you all have your hands raised for that because it's all of us who do this that's the central I think one of the central messages here so, uh, Dave, there are four parts to tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, the first part is the background. I'm going to do that, a little bit about the background around the project, how we got started. Second is going to be about data collection. Dave Gray will do that presentation. Then we're going to have the findings, and Kirk, the scientist, will do that. And then I'll have the recommendations, and we'll have some discussion at the end about the LBA's role. Because I think to sort of cut to the chase here, we do have some significant recommendations, 
But one of them is that the Lake Boone Commission, which was the organization that actually submitted the proposal through Stowe to the state and got the $154,000, will no longer have primary responsibility. It's shifting over to the Lake Boone Association, which we've concluded is a much better position to manage and run and operate this project. So that transition is an important piece here. There are many people who uh, worked on this Lake Boone Association, Town of Stowe and Hudson. The MVP is the Massachusetts um, uh, part of the uh, uh, environmental protection that ran this. It's a municipal vulnerability preparedness program. Uh, program. They put in the, the $154,000. And then Brown and Caldwell is the company of scientists that uh, Kirk works for. Now, of course, we have to say a few things just to make sure we're clear from the top level perspective here. Lake Boone is a wonderful place. Now, I'm going to say, by the way, that these slides are things that any of you can use when you want to share any of this with any other people. So we've tried to have a good, good collection here. But Lake Boone is indeed a wonderful place. It also is a resource for the community. And that's an important message because it's not just the residents who are taking care of a need to and benefit from the lake, but it's Stowe, Hudson, the broader communities, the people come in to the launch and have their boats uh, uh, here and others from elsewhere who use the, the, uh, the lake. So it's a resource for the community. And it is a wildlife habitat. If you especially look at the Fourth Basin, you go in there, it just feels like you're in another serene natural world. If we can maintain the lake, for all of those reasons, we'll have a huge uh, success here. Now, it's also important to remember that Lake Boone is part of a larger hydrologic system. Here's Lake Boone. The water flows into Lake Boone from the watershed around the lake. It flows out through the dam into the Assabet River and then goes up to Maynard and it's part of the Suasco, Sudbury, Assabet and Concord River system. So we've also been working with ORS and other, um, uh, the it used to be the organization uh, for the Aspid River, now expanded, but they're a collaborative community, so we tried to make sure we include those. But the important thing is that Lake Boone is indeed at risk. Here you can see an algae bloom took place last year. This is a significant problem. It has led in the past to a closing of the town beach and some warnings for the entire lake that would last several weeks. That puts your enjoyment of the lake at risk. It puts the, the wildlife at risk. And it is just something that's going to get worse with climate change. In fact, part of the funding for this is for, is for the climate change concept. But the, the warming of the lake increases the risk, warming of the atmosphere increases the, the risk of the algae. So what do we do about that? Go ahead, next one. So, um, you know, just to get oriented, you all know this, but you know, there's the big first basin, then there's the second basin, the third basin, it's a little more natural than the fourth basin. Here's where the launch is. Here's where Halleck Point is that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the beach, the dam, the narrows, and then some things we found out about Monaghan, uh, Monaghan's Cove, Cattell property. So, in fact, the lake has been studied many times, over 50 years or more. A variety of state and local studies have done about nutrients coming into the lake, how all that's going on. Phosphorus is actually a central one. And we've seen ranges over the years that have gone, you know, estimating that 80% of the phosphorus loads were from septic systems. Another study said that 10% were. So the inconsistency of these studies was the primary drive for having a much more comprehensive study. Uh, the grant was submitted by the Lake Boone Commission. Uh, it was a competitive grant. Uh, we are pleased to get it. The key components of it are that the citizen scientists collect the data. I mean, this is a, a very important concept that you all are fully capable of doing some very sophisticated scientific measurements. <clears throat> Consultants analyze the data to bring the scientific expertise. We incorporate climate change into that model so we can do a long-term projection. 
It helps us better understand the lake, and that's not just Kirk understanding it, but all of us understanding it, so that we can all be part of a long-term action plan. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dave to talk about the data collection process. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, this is the outfall right there at the Barton Road Dam, and uh, that level is uh, very important for estimating or getting a pretty good handle on the flow rate of the water, the water going out of the uh, lake. Uh, so uh, we can get a flow rate, um, and then of course there are other things. We want to see how much water is flowing in. We can measure some of it coming in the tributaries. We can measure how much rain falls in the watershed. Uh, and then Kirk, with his magic uh, spreadsheets, figures out how much is coming in in groundwater. And pretty soon you have a pretty good model of uh, what's going on. And these models are really critical. Here is a, a model for uh, nutrients. Uh, so with that rain runoff, we get nutrients coming just running off the surface. We have groundwater for what soaks in and may carry with it what is in septic. Uh, we can even get nitrogen from the, uh, from the sky. It can come down with the rain. But the one thing that was not really quantified before was how much was retained in the sediment. You know there's some good muck down there. And, uh, and there's a very interesting interchange we'll talk about later between the nutrients that are in the water going into the sediment during part of the year and then coming back out in the fall. Guess what? Just when we had algae blooms. What a coincidence. So part of this program was getting the training done and Rebecca did an excellent job of pulling all of us together and the green team as a, um, uh, an extracurricular activity of the uh, Neshoba High School. Uh, and Sonia really, uh, actually these are the co-captains right here in this picture. So we got the leadership and there were several more that came out too. So that was terrific. So here's Rebecca at work, uh, keeping us going in the right directions. And we had COVID back then too, so we had to deal with it. But uh, we had trained scientists, that, uh, citizen scientists that went out with clipboards, chain of custody forms, uh, Charts here with the, uh, the sample points identified clearly so we could identify all the results that came back. And it was really quite a collection of data. We talked about the water flow and the, the various sources there, and then the sediment load of nutrients. And um, we measured many different parameters there. Nitrogen in various forms, total phosphorus, chlorophyll, um, and then we did some measurements of the cyanobacteria, the toxins that they produce, as well as the flow rate, water clarity. Water clarity has a very sophisticated measurement with a Secchi disk. How deep can you see this thing? It's a standardized technique that is, uh, is used everywhere. And it's a good indication of how dense the algae or the sediment is uh, that may be stirred up by boats. So it um, lets you know how much light is getting down into the deeper areas getting some of those weeds growing too. So um, there are quite a number of variables that come into play here. So here are the 13 sample sites that we had there. And it's interesting that um, the largest tributary we were pretty much aware of, but it's very substantial, is the tributary coming in Monahan's Cove. So that's draining uh, water from a pretty large watershed you'll see later. So we took samples right at the, um, uh, at the culvert where it goes under Main Street of Hudson. And then there are very minor uh, tributaries that come in uh, down here. Down here under the, uh, into the fourth basin, it trickles through some uh, wetlands there. And there actually is another uh, culvert here which has no flow going through it now and we may want to get that cleared up. So that it could drain better. So this is getting instructions and getting ready to go out in canoes, kayaks, sailboats, uh, you name it. If it floats, we can and can carry a cooler with samples in it. 
We had collections of bottles. Most were much larger than this and in many quantities. Um, so those were sent back to the laboratory to uh, analyze for those things we couldn't measure on site. But we could measure things in person using a, uh, a dissolved oxygen sensor, temperature, and conductivity. And this says over 25 feet of cable, so uh, it gets down to the bottom. And this is the handheld unit that stores all the data in there. So we can just download the data into a computer. And at any time of year, we can get out there and take a sample. So uh, the mail delivery people have nothing on us. Uh, we also have this uh, test for blue-green algae toxins. And it's interesting that this was, I find it very interesting that this was developed in Finland. And we have a number of saunas that were built around the lake by the Finnish people who first settled this area. Uh, and so I think it's very appropriate that we uh, use this test. And it's very similar to a COVID test where you can take a sample uh, drop it onto the coupon, you see the blue coupon, and it will identify pretty quickly if there's a significant amount of cyanotoxins there. So it gives us a quick uh, way with instant results. So it's kind of like a home COVID test, but it does not represent what the state requires for their official uh, use. But uh, for our use, the speed is worth a lot more than waiting for a week to get results back uh, when something green is out there and the kids are wanting to go swimming. Uh, we also uh, did some shallow well testing and I think uh, we have a good sample here. This enabled us to see the composition of groundwater where we have enough shallow wells still present around the lake. Some of them were as shallow as five feet, some 15 feet. We're getting an idea of the water flowing toward the lake could take a sample and analyze it for phosphorus and for its mineral content, total miner minerals as well. So this was very helpful. And then finally, we talked about that lovely bottom of the lake, all that good stuff down there. Last May, the divers from uh, the University of Massachusetts in um, b -b 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 Dartmouth uh, were here and took these samples, core samples, of the muck in the bottom of the lake. So they took out uh, more than a half dozen samples in different parts in the deepest part of the lake, and then they took them back to the laboratory, and they incubated them for three months, I believe, and they controlled the amount of dissolved oxygen that was there. They started out with, um, with uh, a, some oxygen present and then slowly lowered the content, all the time analyzing how much phosphorus was in the water above the sediment. And they could actually get a graph of how much phosphorus was coming, going into the sediment and then coming back out as it ran out of oxygen. And uh, that was very informative because we can take the size of that canister extrapolate it to the area of deep water, in, especially in the first basin of the lake, and get an idea of what total phosphorus is coming back out of the, out of the sediment. So that's a very important dynamic. And so we had quite a number of volunteers that went. This was that, um, the training that we did to get the uh, citizen scientists up to speed and uh, understanding. And again, in any kind of weather here, they're bundled up during this training. So I think I'm going to pass this over to Kirk, who is uh, really the, uh, the brains behind it. And I have loved working with Kirk. I've learned so much. Um, in addition to lake technology, he also is a poet and a musician. So uh, when you hear hard knocks, you're going to hear him again uh, on the music boat. Thank you, Dave. <coughs> and because of that, I actually don't have a voice tonight. We sang for three hours, four hours last night. <coughs> so I'm recovering from that. But I just I want to say what a pleasure it's been to work with, with Dave and Dan and everybody here. Um, I've done a lot of uh, water monitoring programs and modeling programs and over the course of my career. I've never seen one organized with this much energy, consistency, and efficiency. Rebecca, the way you organized the people going out on the lake uh, month after month, collecting the data, depositing it, analyzing it, uh, and making it useful to the people who are trying to 
uh, draw conclusions from it, yourself included, was really commendable. And I really wanted to just point out that this, this was done right, and it was because of all the people who did it uh, with, with, uh, with the energy that they brought. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we learned from all the data that we collected, the different ways we analyzed it. Uh, people who know me know that I could talk about this for the next three hours, which I won't. Uh, but uh, I'll try to give you an overview of what we learned along the way. Yeah. Our team consisted of uh, a lot more people than this. Uh, these were some of the, uh, the specialists that, that participated. Uh, I served as the director of the project. Uh, Andrew Goldberg in the middle was the project manager and organized a lot of our services for the, uh, uh, the, uh, the project and helped with the administration of the grant. And Clifton Bell, uh, from our, one of our offices in Virginia at Brown and Caldwell, uh, is a uh, world-class limnologist. And he understands lake management, the dynamics of lakes, uh, and nutrients in lakes. And provided a lot of guidance on not only the monitoring program from the start, but what we did with the data when we got it back. So somebody earlier referred to this as, as magic. It's not. It's, it's facts and a little bit of art. And what we try to do in, with programs like this is reduce the uncertainty. We're never going to get a perfect answer. Uh, but Dave or Dan showed earlier that when you looked at all the different reports from earlier years, the leading causes, the prevailing causes of problems in the lake really wasn't discernible. One report said it was groundwater. Another report said it was surface water. We really couldn't tell. And so we collected a lot of, ob uh, of data. That's what we observed in, in the lake and the watershed. We did some calculations in, with that. That combines into what we've learned about the lake and the story that it tells. And we'll talk about that tonight. And that ultimately can guide what we do. And Dan will circle back to you and talk about that in a few minutes. There were three ways that we looked at the data uh, with the modeling. And one of the things that I think is important in any kind of study like this is to not forget the water itself. Right? The, the, the impetus for this was nutrients flowing into the lake causing algae blooms, which can be toxic. But we've got to back up a little bit from that. We have to look at the water. How much water is flowing into the lake during what times of year and through what avenues? And one of the avenues is from groundwater. Lake Boone is largely perceived as a groundwater spring-fed lake. Uh, that's partly true, uh, but we learned a lot more about the surface water that contributes to the lake during this study as well. Uh, and so we did some modeling to, to help discern that. We also did some modeling to understand phosphorus loads now uh, and how that puts the lake at risk and phosphorus loads under future climate scenarios. We're finishing that work up right now to understand how the lake's condition, if we didn't do anything, could either deteriorate or improve. And then with the management measures that we're applying, and Dan will talk about, we'll, we'll learn a little bit about how robust those will be, how long they will endure uh, with potential climate scenarios in the future. So back to the water. This is, this is where I had a, little, a, a lot of fun. And if I, if I could do this all day long, every day I would. But these little blue dots, uh, represent the measurements that Dave Gray took every day, uh, either at the dam or at his dock, which was calibrated to the, uh, the dam gauge. But this is the elevation of the lake over the course, this was 2020, uh, over the course of the year. Every blue dot is a measurement that Dave took. And the orange line is our simulation model, which blends groundwater and surface water from the rainfall and calculates how much water is flowing in and how much water is flowing out at the weir and through evaporation. And we want to get this right because it helps us understand the relative contributions of water from the surface and from the ground. And so we were really encouraged when we saw this in 2020, uh, but we learned very quickly when we got into 2021, which is a very different hydrologic year. 2020 was quite dry. 2021 was extraordinarily wet. We had 14 inches of rain in the first two weeks of July uh, in 2022. Uh, and we learned very quickly that some of the conclusions that we drew from this were wrong. Uh, and it helped to have that second year of data. And I, I have to say that I am encouraged in certain ways scientifically to see that we're experiencing some drought conditions this year because it'll help us scientifically understand the lake better by getting a bounding condition on the lake. A dry year would be useful scientifically. I know that it's not a good thing uh, to, to wish for a drought, but from a scientific point of view, 
it will provide some very good information and help validate the decisions and, and, and recommendations that we're making. So as a point of contrast to last year, uh, that would be a good thing. What we learned, uh, and this was from 2022, which was a very, very wet year, as I mentioned, is that most of the water that comes into the lake, about half of it, is directly rainfall falling right on the water itself, not on the land and, and running off or, or fil infiltrating through the ground, but just falling onto the lake surface itself. About a quarter of it is water flowing from, uh, from the, uh, this blue area here. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, not, the, not, the, not, not the blue area. This is not color coordinated well. But about 80% of the watershed that drains into the lake through groundwater not in Monaghan's Cove. This blue area here is the watershed, the subwatershed that drains into Monaghan's Cove. And about a quarter of the water that flows into the lake comes f from there over the surface through the stream network there. And that was a surprise to us. We expected this groundwater contribution to the lake to be much larger than it was. And what we found that in a wet year, it's roughly equivalent uh, to the surface water that's produced in this very small portion of the basin. Now this is a more heavily developed part of the basin. There's pavement here where, where there isn't as much in other areas. There is more contour of the land and so water is more likely to run off. Uh, but we measured some very, very high values of runoff uh, with, <laughs> they, they was joking about the scientific nature of the Secchi disk. Uh, it's actually really, really useful and we use a less scientific method to measure the flow. We use orange peels. And this has been used for hundreds of years to drop an orange peel on the surface of the water. It floats just beneath the surface, which is where the average velocity tends to be. And we measured how long it took for orange peels to flow through the culvert uh, under the road. And with that, we had a huge amount of data that we never had before on the amount of water flowing in from this portion of the basin. Now, when we coupled that with what Dave talked about in terms of phosphorus measurements, what, how much phosphorus is coming from different places, all of this groundwater flow we associated with the measurements that we took from the wells. And the phosphorus in the wells was very, very low. And so we concluded that there's not a lot of phosphorus coming into the lake from the groundwater. And that was one of the first most important findings that we made uh, in this study because we could say conclusively now that at least in this year that was not a prevailing source of phosphorus. When we looked at the concentrations that were coming in through the surface streams, those were much higher. And we have the same amount of water coming in. And so we can say fairly confidently right now that the prevailing source of phosphorus in 2022 and probably in a lot of other years is from the surface water, especially in Monaghan's Cove where we get the surface runoff. The rest of the lake is dominated by groundwater, but the concentrations of phosphorus are not anything that would be a concern to us. So I, I'm talking a little bit about phosphorus and I always have to remind myself that that's not part of everyday uh, parlance. Algae grows from nitrogen and phosphorus that makes itself available in water bodies. And in freshwater bodies, there's almost always enough nitrogen. And there's really not a lot we can do to control how much there is. As somebody said, it falls from the sky. I mean, there's just, you can't do much about it, and it's always there. But what you can control is phosphorus and get it down below a threshold where its blending with nitrogen is not sufficient enough to cause algae blooms and to cause things to grow like weeds. Okay? And so it's called a phosphorus-limited uh, water body. This is different in marine waters. In marine waters, it's nitrogen that is the limiting nutrient. But in fresh waters like Lake Boone, it's phosphorus. And this was really, really interesting. When we looked at all of the data together, combined everything we learned about how much water is flowing in from different sources, how much is flowing out, what kind of concentrations of phosphorus it was bringing with it, we learned something really, I think, pivotal. This is all of the phosphorus that comes into the lake, uh, either through Monaghan's Cove, the, the, uh, uh, the tributaries there, and other surface runoff around the lake. Again, there are two other uh, tributaries that flow into the lake. Uh, both of those are, are impeded right now, uh, but they do provide some flow in. And there's just some flow running off people's yards and things like that. Uh, this is the amount of phosphorus coming into the lake from surface water. This, and this is the scale, 
And this is the amount of phosphorus coming into the lake through groundwater. And that's a, that's a significant ratio. We can really say confidently that we think the prevailing source right now uh, is from the surface runoff. But here's the other really interesting thing. Dave talked about the divers that we sent down to collect those cores of sediment and see what was in that and see how much phosphorus comes out of the sediment when the lake goes anoxic. And what I mean by that is in the summertime, the water at the top of the lake, you've all felt this if you've, if you've been swimming, is warmer. And things that are warmer are less dense. And so the warm water stays on the top. The colder water goes down to the bottom because it's heavier, less dense, and it's trapped down there. The upper layer of water, the warm water, can reoxygenate because it's in contact with the air, right? Just the wave action stirs it up and oxygen can get back into the water. That doesn't happen down on the bottom. And things that decay down on the bottom consume oxygen. And so gradually over the course of summer, the oxygen levels at the bottom just go down to almost zero. And we have all kinds of good graphs to show that. When that happens, the phosphorus that settled to the bottom can come back out. That there's a chemical reaction with iron and oxygen that releases the phosphorus and it comes back into the lake. And it's a s significant <laughs> volume of phosphorus. It's equivalent to everything just about that ran off from the surface. Okay? Now phosphorus doesn't grow in the sediment, it doesn't just appear there. Uh, it comes from other sources. It comes from these two sources. And over time, some of the phosphorus that comes into the lake, it just settles down into the sediment and comes back out. So if we manage these sources, we are also managing this as well. But this is a significant source of what we saw in 2022 as a problem. I think we'll get there in just a minute. One of the, the things that we use to characterize the health of the lake is this uh, empirical graph. This has been used for decades, really, uh, to understand how at risk a water body is. This is basically, on, on the, the vertical axis, values that represent how much phosphorus comes into the lake over the course of a year. And on the lower axis, the x-axis here, how long does it stay? Okay, how long is that phosphorus in the lake? And if we're in this zone, we're at some, some significant risk of the lake becoming eutrophic. Eutrophic means it's at risk of so much organic productivity that it can choke the lake of its oxygen and the lake really just dies, the ecosystem dies. Down below the blue line here uh, is, is healthy. That represents a healthy blend of phosphorant nutrient loading and you know, throughput. It may be a lot coming in, but it runs through fast and doesn't cause a problem, or there's just not very much coming in. This represents a healthy lake. This represents a lake that's significantly at risk. And this transition zone between the two signifies a lake that should be managed, but is recoverable. Okay? And historically, that's where Lake Boone kind of sat. It just straddled the border uh, of crossing into the, uh, the zone where it would be considered at risk. But many of the data points that we collected from past reports suggest that it's in that transition zone, which is encouraging because it means it's recoverable. We can make management decisions to help the lake recover. One thing I want to point out is that this scale, for those of you who are mathematicians, is a log scale. Okay, so this is not linear. So this is 0.1, this is 1, this is 10. Every line here is a different order of magnitude. And if we plotted this on a regular scale, all of these points would look like they're right on the green line. They're very close. So this was an encouraging bit of, of sort of a starting point for us. We said, okay, the, the lake is, is not so far into this risk area that it's not recoverable. There are things we can do to bring it back into good health. And in fact, in 2021, uh, the data that we got from that very wet year suggested this lake is very, really quite healthy. And, and for most of the year, that was true. We saw concentrations of phosphorus in the lake that were at or below the recommended level from the EPA for a lake of this, this size and this type. And that was very true. But the catch is the phosphorus that was coming in was settling out to the sediment. And that's been happening for years, decades. There's a lot of what's called legacy phosphorus in the sediment. And that came back out of suspension. And I think we have a graph on this, Dave. I'm not sure what the next one is. Well, that's a little rosier than what I was about to say. But <laughs> I'll improvise a little bit. <coughs> the, yeah, here we go. Thank you. 
I talked about the lake stratifying with the warm water up on top, cold water on the bottom, and the oxygen just depletes down here. What happened was four months of the summer last year, the oxygen in this lower layer went to zero in the first basin. Most of the lake is not deep enough for this to happen, but the first basin is almost all of it. Okay, and so the oxygen went to zero, and the phosphorus just started coming out of suspension. But because these layers don't mix, it was trapped down here. It's like put in a closet, just put in storage, like a bank account. In the fall, when the temperature of the air started to cool, this upper layer started to cool, and pretty soon, the temperature gradient was stable. It was constant, and now all the water mixes. And all of this phosphorus that's been being pumped out of the sediment over the summer came to the top, was exposed to sunlight, and it grew into algae. And we saw 10 or 12 algae blooms in October last year, and it was predominantly because of the phosphorus coming out of the sediment. So those are the two really significant findings for us, and Dan's gonna talk a little bit about what we're gonna do with that. But really, the prevailing cause of, of harmful al algae blooms in Lake Boone is water running off the surface right now. When I say that it would be useful to have a drier year, I'd like to be able to see if that same assessment holds true in a dry year. It was very convincing in a very wet year. But what's that ratio look like in a dry year? We do want to find that out at some point. But again, by managing the sediment that comes into the lake, we're also managing the sediment that finds its way, sorry, the phosphorus that finds its way into the sediment, and we're managing the potential for that to come out in subsequent years. So we're doing two things at once by doing some smart things with managing the water and the phosphorus that comes into the lake uh, because it controls the concentrations in the water and it controls the amount of phosphorus that gets to the sediment. I think that's the, the summary of what we learned. We did talk a little bit about this. Um, as I mentioned, some of you probably saw that. We can go back to that. This was in October, I think, and this was a result of all of that phosphorus coming out from the summertime and then making its way to the surface in the fall. And there were 10 or 12 of these, Dave, I think. Some of them showed some toxicity. Uh, and some of them were site-specific. And I think one of the things that we're, we're going to do moving forward is try to create a network around the lake where we can monitor where this is happening, whether or not it's toxic, and what to do about it. Dan mentioned that one of the most important questions that we're trying to answer in addition to the prevailing sources and causes is what happens with climate change. So we have these models that we've put together now. We can run simulations and scenarios to, to, to ask, that, ask those questions. What if? Right, this was a question where we asked, what happens if we have a very dry summer? There's no rain. Uh, that's not inconceivable. It's part of what uh, a lot of climate models are suggesting for the Northeast. Uh, and we see a three degree increase in temperature. What happens? Well, what we see, and I won't go through all these lines here, but what we see is that for a long portion of the summer, the lake level would drop and it wouldn't even be flowing out. So the water becomes stagnant in the lake. And that what we call residence time, the amount of time that the phosphorus sits in the lake, cooking and baking and turning into algae is extended. And so there's just a lot more potential for harm that way. Now, there are other scenarios that suggest that rainfall may increase in the spring and the fall. There are different distributions of rainfall that we're going to look at. But basically, we can use our tools and the data to ask what-if questions and then use that knowledge to really judge the durability of the management measures that we're going to recommend. Dan, I think this is where we, we kind of go back to you. Uh, in terms of the recommendations and how this process and project really built a sense of community uh, with everybody who participated in it. Well, I want to give a big thanks to Kirk. We are so fortunate that Kirk lives on the lake. <laughs> this is personal, this is real, and so he's continuing his involvement. And he's a world-class expert, and as I can see, this is bringing depth to understanding. To me, one of the things I noticed about your uh, model of the transition zone is that, in fact, Lake Boone is in the middle of many transitions. 
One transition is if you go back 100 years, most of the people, they had outhouses. You know, it was a, it was a very different kind of environment. Over time, now with, you know, redoing septic systems, that's enhanced, and that's why we don't see the kind of impact of septic that you talked about with the, the uh, subsurface water. Um, we also see a transition in the level of engagement of the residents. The fact that we could have a citizen science program and have dozens of people participating mean that our, we're not just saying, yeah, let's do some things about the lake, but mostly let's enjoy it. It's a recognition that we have this responsibility and opportunity. And it's also a transition point because if we do act, we really can make a difference, and if we don't, we have serious risk over the next decade of losing our lake in, you know, in, in many different subtle and, and uh, deep ways. Um, and I think the, the message with this is that our citizen scientists weren't just collecting data, they became advocates. So they are actively involved and have personal investment and now can move forward in, in helping to implement some of the solutions. Okay, so let me go through relatively quickly through the action plan. Uh, first is to mention that uh, Rebecca was in charge of collecting some 40 or so different recommendations that came from all of our experts. We have a scientific advisory board. We have, um, uh, you know, different experts that Brown and Caldwell brought in and uh, conservation commissions, uh, conservation directors, and so on, all reviewed these to try to see what could be the most effective and most viable and affordable. So first is to begin with the success. The Halleck Point acquisition, we recognize the development on Halleck Point would be a significant impact on the lake. Adding another 10 or so residents here could have some significant impact. Uh, and so by protecting that, we had, uh, I don't know, 100 or so people, I believe, who contributed to this and were able to, to save this Halleck Point. Major success. So we're going to go through a few uh, different goals here. One is that we need this whole lake perspective, that we need to understand, as Kirk was saying, the dynamics of the entire lake, the environment, and not just have drawdown as a separate thing, the solitude weed treatment as a separate thing, and then some algae things. It's all together. Second is that we're going to continue this measurement plan. We don't have the resources to do at the same level of sophistication. But we now have a much more targeted way to identify what we need to look at, the flow of water, measure the phosphorus. We're continuing those measurements even as the grant winds down. We'll produce an annual report from that. Uh, the goal three is to have the Lake Boone Association take over the project. Now, in fact, LBA has been the lead operative. Dave's been the key person. Uh, and I, I just want to thank Dave for the terrific job he's done in this. You can see this, his expertise as well. But the, we need to understand that, that Lake Boone Association will have this responsibility. Uh, there'll be a leadership team. Uh, we'll also convert the advisory board that we've worked with to a science advisory board that will continue. And I'm pleased to say that Kirk has agreed to chair that advisory board. So thank you very much for that, Kirk. <laughs> LBA will continue to manage the monitoring program, communication with the public. All of these slides and so on become a resource for communicating as large as we can. Uh, and LBA will be responsible for reporting to town officials. So the major work of this is phosphorus reduction. Now in many ways, the, the recommendations here are not radical. They are fundamental and involve limiting the surface runoff that carries nutrients, maintaining septic systems, stormwater management systems, We'll go through a few examples of those. So uh, fertilizer, as many of you know, fertilizer has these three numbers. There is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. This number in the middle is the amount of phosphorus in fertilizer. Dave went to a local store and saw these two and said, look at this one. This is an effective fertilizer, but has low phosphorus. 
So the, the fertilizers that we put on our lawns, if you do, it has an impact. And reducing the phosphorus is a key piece that will help there. Dave? Another is to create vegetated buffers. And many of you have actually done this, but when you meet with like the Conservation Commission, they say that you need to protect the water along the edge. We've seen that with several different properties. Vegetated buffers are crucial for controlling the runoff and maintaining the, and soaking up some of the nutrients. Massachusetts has a manual, the Massachusetts Buffer Manual, to explain what types of plants are good. Uh, we've also, as you know, been operating this, maintaining your septic systems, working with Casticelli. They have generously given donation, you know, a reduction in cost, uh, but that's a crucial to do every couple of years. And also even your dish detergent to use low phosphorus. So this is sort of the part of the things that we as residents can do. Now the towns themselves also need to do a piece. One is managing the stormwater systems. Um, <clears throat> these are done managed by the Hudson and Stowe Highway Departments. We've also been in discussion with them about how to proceed, uh, maintaining, cleaning the storm drains, um, and making sure that people don't dump waste into the, uh, to the stormwater systems. And overall, just constantly think about your impact. If you're raking leaves, they get into the lake, that's adding nutrients. Washing your cars, do it away from the lake. Pick up after your pets. And limiting impervious surfaces means that if you have a lot of driveway space, it doesn't let the water in. If you reduce that, the water can go through. All right, goal five deals with the algae themselves, not just the nutrients that are coming in. This test kit that we have this is actually a significant change. The, test, the, the way the state tests for algae is, um, is they send a, a sample to a lab. It's pretty expensive. It can take a week or two to get results. These are instantaneous results and enables us to have much more control of monitoring. That actually has led to a recommendation that we've made to the Board of Health to implement a two-tier system. Now you recall the times that we've essentially kind of shut down the lake when there's been this kind of large algae blooms, major problem. We don't need to do that. If the Board of Health, their part, does the monitoring of the town beach and can decide to close the beach when toxins are found, the Lake Boone Association will have our citizen scientists go around the lake observing where the blooms are, stay away from those, doing testing, and notifying you where we have found the toxins. It isn't all over the entire lake all at once. It's very localized. Uh, and uh, Dave's meeting with the Board of Health next week for final confirmation approval of this plan. Now, uh, at the last meeting of the LBC, there was some considerable discussion about especially the uh, wake boats, that we've seen a growing number of them uh, certainly enjoyable, fun to do, but it also is significant. But it stirs up with the sediment underneath and the shoreline erosion. Uh, uh, the LBC will be taking a look at this. Um, I don't know if we have it yet on our agenda but for the next meeting, but we are going to need to take a look at this, see whether our existing regs are enough or whether we need something else. And uh, communicating with the public. Uh, there we've, there's this meeting, we're going to have a printed brochure that summarizes this that will be mailed to all residents. Uh, we'll continue to use the emails. We have a Healthy Lake Boone website, healthylakeboone.org. Uh, we also, when new residents come in, we'll meet with them and help make sure they understand. Uh, and then make sure our communication is not just among us. We will also pursue funding. Frankly, most of the things we can do with a very low budget, and that was part of the criteria Rebecca and everybody else used was to make sure these were affordable, but there are some things that could have some funding uh, requirements and there are opportunities with the state, federal, and local sources. Now, beyond those basics, there are a few ideas that we continue to study as more sort of dramatic steps. 
Uh, one is, are there ways to filter the storm water before they enter the lake, like a sock around. There's a, there are these protective socks they have. Or whether when we do the weed treatment, should we harvest the weeds and pull them out so they don't leave nutrients? Uh, alum treatment, this is aluminum, this alum that is um, it, it, uh, spread throughout the lake, goes down to the sediment, and then it binds the phosphorus, and it helps prevent that phosphorus coming from the sediment. It is, however, very expensive. It's used successfully in some places, but a significant expense. Uh, there have been some discussions about aerators to improve the oxygenation, um, but we would need too many, this is, you know, Brown and Caldwell's review of this, need too many to really have a significant impact. So I'll, I'll wrap up with a few special projects. Uh, one is to increase the flow into basins three and four. In our studies, we found that the, um, the, the culverts that were flowing through here and here were actually uh, either blocked fully or partially, and we're going to have the town clear up those to bring in more fresh water. That helps. Another special project is the Cattell property that you may know. Uh, Alan Cattell passed away a number of years ago. The family has maintained that property. Uh, it's significant in size. A developer wants to put 22 houses here. Uh, we have assured that they will not allow here, well, I won't say finally assured, but we have an understanding from the developer. They will not have uh, docks along here. The basin can't support it. So there will be no power boating uh, to further disrupt in this part of the basin. Uh, and there are a few other things that we put in the uh, discussions with them. Next week, there's a meeting with the Hudson Conservation Commission. We've contracted with a lawyer to help us uh, review those as well. Now, I also want to mention about the Barton Road Dam. This is a major piece of work. The Stowe um, uh, Town Meeting did approve money for uh, the next phase of the study. But the problem is the dam is at risk. Now, <clears throat> that is a whole story in itself. It's a significant expense and one that the state mandates that we have to make sure that the flow of water, that, that it's, it's solid, but it gives us an opportunity to add an improved spillway structure or change that outflow area that we currently have in the dam, and that would enable us to uh, have either deeper outflows or at least more fine-tuned uh, controls. And I'll say that the dam repair was a great example of how all of this helps uh, when we had this collapse of uh, uh, just on the other side here uh, a year and a half ago. Um, it, it was a, a serious problem showing, uh, uh, but the, the town within 24 hours had that repaired. That's a whole story in itself. But I think both the initial success of the Halleck uh, Point project and the success here are sort of bookends on how powerful we've been able to become as a community to help protect our lake. So to summarize for residents, um, you know, limit surface runoff that carries nutrients, maintain the septic systems, prevent invasive weed infestation, and just constantly observe the lake. Um, you can skip over this. So. Um, Let's, uh, you know, there's a lot of information. Appreciate your attention here, but let's see if there are any questions or comments or concerns or ideas or anything. The test kits, how much do they cost? Uh, what's that? Test kits. The oh, the test kits are what? $10 or something? $35. $35. Yeah, so do you want to comment, Dave, about how we'll manage and distribute these? Uh, yeah, we have the, t the, the test kits are available. We mail order them in, uh, $35 a piece. And uh, yeah, we could train you very quickly on that. They're, they're pretty self-explanatory from the manuals. But uh, yeah, yeah, we can make those available. Um, I think we'll try to have people assigned to the different basins to uh, have some
control and, and consistency for uh, doing that. But uh, we, we'll, we'll have to talk and let's see what we can put together. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll give you the contact information, sure. Other comments or questions? Can you go up to the mic? I'm not sure if I'm going to take everybody's time with this question, but since we are running out of questions, get really close. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Closer. 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 I'm not used to working with the mic. Sorry. Okay. Um, just, a, just a question, technical question. Um, if if uh, part of the problem is the the phosphorus laden anoxic layer. Could, could you try to work uh, a sort of a siphon uh, uh, system for draining the deep parts of the lake to remove that, that, new, uh, that layer? That, that is one of the things that we talked about a little bit, but we, uh, we stopped short of going too far into that because we recognize that the lake is part of a larger uh, watershed. And if we siphon the, the poor quality water out of our lake, it goes into the Assabet River and then flows downstream. And there are reaches of the Assabet River that are in real trouble too and have been listed uh, on, on uh, federal lists for a long time. So we, we, we thought about that kind of thing, uh, but realized that we probably would be causing more problems than we'd be solving. Other, other questions? Wes Fisher. Um, I'm wondering about the, a little bit more detail on the Cattell pro Yeah, a little more detail on the Cattell property meeting. That, that seems quite, uh, quite important for us. There have been discussions over the past year about the Cattell property. There have been meetings within the town as well as meetings of a focus group dealing with the Cattell property and with the lawyer. The idea of the developer is to, as I say, develop 22 homes there, which is the maximum they could put in in a normal subdivision. Um, We've been talking directly with the developer who I think genuinely cares about the lake. They don't want to sell a property and then have the lake collapse in that area and you know that would be a problem. They want to sell a good piece of property. Uh, and so they have agreed, as I say, to this uh, not having the docks and a few other things. Now, uh, it's moved now from the informal discussions uh, to formal review by the uh, planning board, uh, zoning board in Hudson, and the next meeting is the Conservation Commission reviewing those plans. So um, I, I'm blanking on date. I think it is on the 15th, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at 7 p.m., or the 16th, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blocking, but uh, that, that's the next step of this process. Uh, and it is an open public meeting if you want to be part of that. Did that answer your question? Have they submitted definitive plans at this point? Uh, not yet. There were, they did submit, uh, I think we forwarded it along actually, a, 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 they had a first plan. Uh, that had some special zoning, they decided not to do it. Then we distributed the second plan, uh, which is still sort of at the broad conceptual level. They've kind of mapped out more or less where the homes would be, but not the actual locations. I haven't seen what they're providing to the Conservation Commission at this uh, next step in the process. And I just want to take this moment actually to thank Red. I don't know if we thank you yet, but Red has been uh, the liaison with the Solitude Group and has fundamentally redefined what was a problematic relationship into much more of a partnership with them. And I want to thank you for the caliber of what you've done with that, Red.
unless someone else has an agenda item, I would like to give you the results of our bingo game in third place with there, uh, with at least three bingos was Karen Gray. Give it up for Karen Gray. <laughs> Second place, Joe Parse back here with four bingos. And first place with only three blocks, three squares empty, Kathy Miles. <laughs> Congratulations, Kathy. You can pick up a a shirt or bag of your choice tonight. <laughs> Thanks for playing bingo, everybody. <laughs> Listen, uh, what these guys, the time these guys put in, these volunteers, has been tremendous. So it really helps us on our lake, and, and hopefully we can use this information in the future to, to really make this lake pros prosperous for all of us. So a big round of applause for all the gentlemen and ladies involved in this. Thank you. So with that, actually, Dave Gray has some pictures of the uh, eagles that have been spotted around the lake here. Um, for the newcomers, um, I don't know if anyone else has seen them, but it's, a, it's quite the sight. Uh, Karen Gray has a good story to tell about what they saw the other day when they were out in the boat. Uh, Dave and I were out watching the eagles soar over the uh, town beach against a uh, against a, la a uh, sodden sky. We saw the eagles soaring in uh, just nothing but joy. J just so beautiful to watch because you could see how wonderful it was to fly. And Dave looked down to correct the course, and I watched those eagles connect their talons and tumble down through the sky, just pinwheeling. Um, uh, we looked it up when we got back, and apparently they know when to stop. <laughs> and then they go to the nasty. <laughs> which is a good sign, which means there's going to be more to come. So that's very good. So with that, if there's any other questions, uh, I know Red's hot to get back to the Celtics game, and we'll see how they do. So thank you guys very much. Yeah, if, if anyone wants to take a look at the equipment we use for measurements, uh, we've got them here. Oh, yeah, you you got to see this. So how, how do you take a sample of lake water 20 feet down without a scuba tank? It's obvious. You get one of these. <laughs> Two wiffle balls, a piece of pipe, and actually there's a special bracket to hold it and some bungee cord to hold them apart. You lower this down the 20 feet. It's got water in it, and then you give it a quick jump, and the balls slip in there and lock in the sample. Then you bring it up to the surface and run it into the sample jar. And you're all set. <laughs>